Hey friends, welcome back to the Guitar Max channel and this video is part two of my lengthy interview with virtuoso guitarist Chris Impelliteri. So this whole interview is very long so I'm releasing it in several different parts and in this second part of the interview Chris talks about some cool technical details like the picks he uses and what the main guitar is that he's using right now, as well as clearing up the mystery behind what happened with the very short-lived signature guitar that he had from Dean Guitars a few years ago. And we talk about the crazy Animetal USA band that he was in and why the band didn't continue despite being really popular with fans. Let's go ahead and get right into part two of my interview with Chris Impelliteri. So I, uh, getting ready for this interview, I asked some people, you know, on YouTube, I did a post there like, hey, I'm going to interview Chris Impelliteri. What questions do you want me to ask? Most of them were, were pretty bad, honestly, but uh, everybody wants to know uh, what kind of picks do you use? I use in-tune picks that are 1.5 millimeter jazz. Okay. Jumbo jazz, actually. So pointed. Right? Hold on. Well, let me, no, start sure, yeah, yeah. Hold on, people. Here, yeah. I'm grabbing for you, boss. Oh, cool. Thank yeah, you. so that, that's what I use. They're nice. 1.5 millimeter. I started with 2.0, yeah, but I found 2.0 where there was too much resistance. Okay. You know, that's one thing I noticed. I, sadly, I pick really hard, which is a really bad habit. So I tell people, don't do that. That's um, one of your characteristics i mean that's uh, you know why because I, I i'm infatuated by a really good rim shot on a snare ah uh, yeah you know so there's a way we can go like bup, 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 or you can go you know like crack, 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 crack. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so when i pick i really try to articulate each note right. but i want it to sound almost like you're playing that perfect rim shot right you know because i i feel like that percussive nature or attack it, it helps jump out of the track oh so yeah, i can yeah. really hear the solo yeah but you know when you play really complex passages picking hard is not a good thing mm. right um and if you do it's probably much better to use a pick that's much thinner than that yeah I, well this is it's, it's it's a tough material but yeah so so yeah but it's a full-size pick but uh pointed yeah. But but it, it's called it's by a company called Intune Guitar Picks. I didn't okay. know anything about them except I, I really dig the new guitar player in Judas Priest, Richie Faulkner. Oh, and yeah, I watched yeah. him play when he was trying. I was like, oh great. And, he, and I, yeah. I saw him do said something about a pick. I'm like, what's that? It was Intune. I was like, well, who's okay. this Intune? You know? Yeah. That time I was just using the uh, the Dunlop mm -hmm. um, Jumbo Jazz, but they're nylon. Okay. And I I felt like the nylon kind of felt like it got caught in the string. Hmm. You know? Okay. So I ordered some of those and I started with the 2.0s and went, oh my God, there, there's there's no um, friction. They don't bind in the string. Right. Right. They so don't you do like, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Every note. And of course, but I, then I had to move back to 1.5 because it was just too thick. Right. Um, so anyways, but I've been using that. I've probably used that on the last two or three records, those okay. picks. I really like them. Wow. Okay. Just me, you know. Okay. So now you guys know. All right. So you've been playing, I mean, you, we talked a little bit about, you know, you've been, you've bought a few vintage guitars lately, but I feel like lately Charvel has been, has that been your main guitar for studio stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Live? I've been using the, um, well, again, hang on, let me go find it. Let's okay. do this. I'll show you. Hold on. It's, <laughs> it's probably easier if I just bring it in. All sure. Up. Okay. So this one is the you can play it by the way if you want to feel it. it's 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 the one that i've been playing the most i've been recording a lot of the records with this one yeah um sorry here sorry there you go so okay. this was handmade by grover jackson and mike shannon okay so grover and shannon they're the original um charvel builders right mm -hmm. especially mike shannon um for anybody that follows charvel um what put Charvel on the map was Eddie Van Halen, right? Sure, yeah. And and during that period in the late 70s, it was Grover Jackson, Wayne Charvel, and I believe Mike Shannon. And so this guitar, there's a story about this. A friend of mine, he's the Charvel artist rep, um, Mike Tempesta. And Mike kept calling and goes, dude, you got to come down and check this guitar out. 
and he goes, I want you to have this. And I'm like, what is it? And he, so he sent me a, a picture of it, a text. Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's, it's like, what's up with the blood and the right, splatter? Yeah. Like, no, been there, you know. And so basically I went down to the Charvel shop and as soon as I picked it up, I went, oh no, it played so good. And yeah. then I plugged it into one of uh, EVH, you know, the EVH head. Yeah. And it sounded even better. So I was like, oh shit. Mm. So he gave it to me. I took it home and I never put it down. I, I've used that on the, the the two records, Venom. I think that's on Venom and it's also on the Nature of the Beast. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's just, you know, there's something about it. And even you can even see in there, you see where it says Grover, where he did it with his fingers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know what's crazy about this guitar? So they built these as a uh, a very limited production run in 2007. The guitar was supposed to be sold at the store for I think sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars. Wow! They didn't sell one. It, who, oh. Kids don't have that kind of money. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. but it was like sixteen or seventeen grand. This one had sat in the warehouse up until I don't know how many years ago for years. Right. Right. Until Mike called me because you've got to check this out. And at the time, it didn't have a humbucker in the neck. Oh, it wow. was just a single coil, so we had the body routed to add the humbucker there. Oh wow! And the funny thing is, it turns out they did out, a good job routing it. I yeah, think. but the funny thing is, it turns out I never use it. I always use the bridge pickup. Really? Yeah. Even yeah. for lead stuff. Yeah, for leads always. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, yeah. For the people watching, this is a really flat, really thin, flat neck. Here. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's actually you know what people don't realize. So, um, you play Les Pauls. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Les Paul has a 12-inch radius, right, right. to curve, right? Yeah. So this is a 12-inch all the way down. Okay. Charvel and Jackson generally do compound radiuses. Right. Where they start, what is it, like 12? By the time you end, you're around 16. Yeah, yeah. This is down. 12 consistently all the way down, really? which is exactly like a Les Paul. Okay. You know? So that guitar I really like a lot. And like I say, I've done a couple mods. Like, you know, this originally had, um, I think we cut a hole here okay yeah. so move those this down. would get in my way right you know and so basically i moved the volume down here um also at this point i moved this to i just i like a much smaller switch i hate anything that hits my finger mm. you know it just it i don't know because the the aggressive picking that you're talking about you <laughs> it's, whack all that stuff well right you can yeah. yeah you can yeah. you're pinky it's depending you know it's funny this thing i just did for this magazine the other night I realize I have three different picking styles. Okay. I have one where people don't realize I will actually anchor my pinky okay. to the body. Yeah. So like right? this kind of thing? Exactly. Like, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. And then I also on the record on, especially on Venom, if you watch the Venom solo, I'm actually anchoring my forearm right uh, here. Okay. And don't touch this. So it's a very loose wrist. It's like tremolo picking. Right. But it's really So no hard. palm muting at all. No Because a lot of people muting. are kind of always palm muting a little bit. You right? know what? Yeah. Um, forgive me, you guys won't be able to see this, but I will show you something because I just had to send Young Guitar Magazine this. I think there was something on my social media with this. Um, hang on, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Forgive me if you have to edit this. So that's it, and then and then yeah, the other one is like it's exactly it's almost that. a Marty Friedman. Oh, he's a little not more not like, yeah, but he's but, a the, little... but your lit it has yeah. to be a very very loose wrist to do right. it, right. and it's really inaccurate. I mean, you have to practice for about an hour just to walk in here, yeah, because what happens? Your hand starts drifting, and you have no sure. control, yeah, yeah, right. Hence why a lot of times I will anchor with my pinky on the body, right, right, and then the other way I'll literally just palm muting, so then I am on the bridge resting, right, yeah, right, yeah. So I just found those are the ways that I, I use those different styles but i'll do them depending on what the song calls for mm -hmm. right so i find like in a song like anybody can watch our music video venom mm -hmm. the solo it's almost trem picking mm -hmm. right but again anchored here it took me probably an hour to lock in where i wasn't mm -hmm. the hand wasn't falling off right once i got it it had such a just a unique picking sound yeah a pick attack that i really hadn't heard before at least from me right right so i started playing with an experiment and went oh this is really cool so i used it yeah. So, anyways, but so, but that's one of the guitars I'm using a lot of. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure this this is one that people are going to recognize. Obviously, they've seen it in, in different music videos and promos and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you know, on on the subject of of playing technique and that kind of stuff, you know, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you about is your rhythm parts. It has to do with your rhythm parts. Mm -hmm. So you do a lot of rhythm parts, especially if it's like an intro riff of a song or something like that. I think Rat Race is always the example I think of yeah. where you're doing these pedal 
uh, rhythm parts, yeah, right? Yeah, You've got a roof. bass note and then some moving notes or moving chords on top of it. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, if you're using open strings, that's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. But if you're not using open strings, if you've got, you know, like I think you do a lot of stuff in like F sharp or something like that, mm -hmm. where you've got a second fret bass note. How do you do those? Because you told me, I thought you were using your thumb over the top of the neck to get the bass note, but you said you don't do that. No. So are you, are you just using like like a first finger well, on the bass note? Here, let me see. Yeah. I haven't played my guitar all day, but. Let me try to see your pick. Sure, yeah. My pick. <laughs> right? So, depending on what you're doing, of course, I'm going to hit a table. So, hang on. <laughs> That's not going to work. I'm going to be like doing Here, I'll tell you what. Let me grab it. So, if it's doing something like this. Let me. Uh... Right? Something like that. Yeah. So can you see it? So the thumb is up, right? So, I, I mean, when you're, right, doing kind oh, okay. of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you're using your middle finger. Yeah. You're using your middle finger for the tell. bass note. Yeah, it is. It okay. is the middle note. Yeah. I'm sorry, middle finger. Middle finger sorry, for the I'm bass note. That. So yeah, that's the way I'm doing it, you know. Okay. I mean, even when I play when I'm, when I'm soloing, you know, I mean, middle the, the thumb is always back here. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I, depending on what I'm playing, right? I yeah. Mean, that's usually my position. I never do this. Right. I don't even know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, sense. having the hand under is always a much better position to be in for you know uh, wide I, I stretches and that kind of stuff, right? But you know, I mean, I've always done. I mean, when we're doing chords, depending on what it is. So, but it's always yeah. off of that, okay. you know? So, That's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Okay. So on the topic of guitars. Mm -hmm. So at one point, I think briefly, you had a signature guitar with Dean. And, so first of all, yeah. that's, no. I no. was actually mad at them. Okay. So the founder, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Elliot. Great guy, yeah. really nice. He wanted to bring me on with Dean guitars. And at the time I was doing Animal. Right. So Animetal was really, um, they, they wanted to have like wild looking guitars, right? And so mm -hmm. his split tail was really cool. Yeah. Beknownst to me, I didn't realize that was actually created for Zach Wilde. Ah, right. Which I didn't realize. So I went down, Elliot flew me down to um, his place in Florida. Yeah, it was Florida. And I said, oh, this is cool. I said, but it's not normal what I'm going to be playing with, with Impelitary. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what do you use? And I'm like, well, I always use strats. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, why don't we build you a strat? And I'm like, well, you know, it's like, I, I'm a pretty much a loyalist where, you know, I want to, I want the Fender headstock right. and just, it's just my comfort level. When I look at it, I go, I'm, I'm at home, you know? So anyways, um, he was like, well, let's build you a strat. So he did. Before I knew it, they were trying to like get pre-orders. Uh yeah. And I was like, Elliot, no. Right. I said, you know, whatever. I don't want to do this. And so I was probably, um, probably within, a, as soon as they did that within a week, I was like on the phone saying, stop, I'm right. not doing this. I don't want yeah. to, this isn't my cup of tea. Because I, I remember when it, when it came out and then it kind of, it just kind of Yeah, because, because I yeah. put, it should have <laughs> never come out. It was more, right. you know, it was marketing kind of thing to see. It's like throwing spaghetti to walls. Anybody interested? And I'm like, first of all, dude, it's not a guitar I'm playing. I don't even, I didn't even right. really like the guitar. Okay, yeah. You know, it was okay. And eventually I gave it to a friend, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, like, with the stuff you're playing now, I mean, would you want to do a signature guitar or are you more sort of like, hey, I, I'm just, I'm going to play whatever I feel like playing and that kind of thing? You know, I think I'm much more, I prescribe much more to the fact that I like being able to have the autonomy or the freedom to right. play whatever I want. Yeah. So, albeit I'm playing this without anybody paying me to play it, right? Mm -hmm. I play it because I love this guitar. Yeah. But if I want to pick up my Strat, my Strat's available. I want to pick up a Les Paul, I can play it. I don't have to feel like, oh God, am I going to get, you know, are they going to call me and go, hey, could you really uh, not do that? Yeah. It's like, no, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, I think, I think endorsements have kind of gotten a little bit out of hand if you ask me, you know, sure, yeah. it, it's, um, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's been really good for a lot of artists careers. As a matter of fact, I've been told by some guitar, I'll, I'll just say guitar sites, right. Mm -hmm. Have told me that we'd probably get a lot more exposure if we endorse like an Ibanez or one of those companies that 
spend a lot of money in the magazines, mm-hmm. right? Because we notice that a lot of their endorsees get a lot of coverage, right? Right, and so we're not part of that group, yeah. Right, it's just a choice. So yeah, well, so, I, I think there are some guitar players where the endorsement is almost the end goal. You know, it's it's yeah, it's like it's it's you know, care, you know, it's like careful what you wish for, you right? Know? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like I, I want to play guitars that I like playing. Yeah. You know, it's like I've had, um, I've certainly had offers, right, mm-hmm. over the years for companies saying, hey, would you be interested in a signature guitar? But it were companies that I really wasn't into. Mm-hmm. Or, and if I did like it, I like maybe one of their guitars. Right. You know, for a certain application. I found over the years, I, I tend to be like a, um, an old dog. I go back to the same tools. It's either a right. vintage Fender Stratocaster, older Charvel style, or it's a Les Paul. Okay. That's it. Yeah. You know, now, yes, I, I have a, recently I bought a, a 75V, mm-hmm. which I really do like a lot. You know, it's, it's the same year Schenker used, right? Right. So that guitar is cool. It's, it's a little weird. It's got to be set up still, so I'm still working on it. Okay. But I do like it. So it may become like number four workhorse. Yeah. But if I do, you realize, hey, I'm using a Fender, mm-hmm. separate, Charvel, separate, Gibson, separate, you know? So, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. You mentioned briefly there. Uh, around that time, the thing with Dean, you were doing Animal USA. Yeah. So I am a huge fan of Animal USA. Uh, I mean, for the people that don't know about it, prepare to be shocked if you go and watch a video or something. <laughs> yeah, but, <be> shocked. <laughs> uh, there were, my understanding is, you know, there were two albums, two Animal USA albums, and then there was one album that was kind of like a combination of the two, I think, that was released in the States or something. But, uh, can you, t- you know, can you tell us like what happened with that band? Because I was under the impression that it was a huge success. Not financially. Oh. Okay. So, um, Animetal USA was actually assembled by Sony, the, right. the, the record label. Sony, um, there was an idea. So, I guess in 1990, where the story began, there was a band called Animetal. Right. Out of Japan, they were very well known Japanese rock artists, right? Yeah. And they did it almost as a joke for fun. Mm-hmm. What they did is they basically took famous anime music mm-hmm. and they would incorporate kind of like metal riffs of famous bands or even their own original metal riff, do crazy solos and just have so much fun with it, wear the makeup, the kabuki kind of thing. Yeah. And so I guess over the years it was always talked about what if we took a, an American or European version of this, yeah. right? And kind of create an I, I'm. I hate using the super band term, right? But right. that's super what they were trying to do. Yeah. They were trying to say, all right, let's take people that are pretty well known, and especially in our market, mm-hmm. which is Japan. So they brought in Rudy Sarzo, who was well known, you know, from Ozzy yeah. and White Snake, and he's been in a lot of great bands. Um, Pat Travers, I'm oh, sorry, Pat Travers. <laughs> yeah. Try that again, Pat Travers, <laughs> yeah. who played with Judas Priest. Scott plays with Scott Judas Travis, Priest. Yeah, yeah. So Travis was winning, and then. Um, and then they brought me in, and yeah. then there was Mike Vissera, who had yeah. a great singer who played with um, Loudness. Yeah. You know, and sure. so um, they brought those guys in. We um, we had to learn all this famous anime music. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, as, an, as a musician wanting to, exp- ex- I guess, expand your boundaries, your limitations, it was fantastic for me to be involved in this because I learned so much. Mm-hmm. Japanese composers... They don't write the way we write. Right. There's nothing ever repeats. Mm. You know, yeah. so in America, you know, you write a really cool riff or whatever. Yeah. You know, you get your your verse, your pre-chorus. Yeah. You know, you use back that to riff, the riff three and, times. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. They never do. So right. it was like, oh my god, it was trying to understand their their um, their time signatures, mm. how they were composing and structuring songs. It was really quite unique um, to learn that, and it was much more challenging to remember it to play live. Mm. But anyway, so. Yeah. We did the record, the first record, the first show we did in Japan, we played in front of 18,000 people. It was, right. it was a festival, actually. It was, it was a lot of bands. It was us, White Snake, Arch Enemy were part of the bill. Right. Uh, Limp Bizkit played it. Mm-hmm. And I remember we, it was the first show we did at Animetal, and we were like, look, they offered us very close to the headlining slot, and we said no. Because we don't know if we're going to suck. We're going to, going, <laughs> we knew we were going to be in front of a lot of people. Yeah. So what we did, this is a crazy story. We played, I don't remember what the arena was, but it was. I know it was 18,000. We said we're going to go on first, which meant we were going on, I think, at noon. Okay. 11 in the morning yeah. at noon, right? right? So we thought, okay, if, there, if it's an 18,000 seat venue, maybe we go out 2,000 people at best. It's early in the morning. No one's going to come. Yeah. Sure enough. Packed. Packed. Yeah. Eighteen thousand people were there yeah. to see this thing, and it was insane. 
it, show went great. Sound check was a disaster. I mean, things like I think my Marshall blew up. We had to get a, a backup head in. So we had no really we had no sound check. I remember SARS okay and goes, Well, good knowing you, you know, we're, we're screwed, we're done, you know. And and the show went over really well. I remember once they got the, the you know, the um the monitors, everything was yeah. situated. It was a great show. So we did that. Then we did um we did a lot of press. Anna Metal in Japan was on the equivalent of Good Morning America. Right. Look, all of us, especially even Rudy, who's been in some pretty legendary bands at the peak of their career, especially yeah. like White Snake, sure. he said, I've never been in anything like this this big in Japan either. And we were all like, in Japan, I mean, even in Pelletier, we've been pretty fortunate enough to have some pretty decent success there. Mm -hmm. I hadn't experienced anything quite like that either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were we were on, again, the biggest TV show. So in America, right. pick your... And you're TV. in you're in full... Your outfit and everything, which must have been a surreal I feel, experience. I feel for Paul Stanley and those guys. Now I know what that's like. It's not as fun as people think. Right. It's itchy. It's it takes a long time to apply, and you're in it all day long, especially when you're doing a lot of the you know the press stuff. But it was crazy, and so we did it, and it was really good for Impelitary because we were reaching, at least I was, reaching a brand new audience that didn't have a clue of who we were. Right. You know, people don't realize in Japan there's 120 million people. Yeah. You know, what do we have in the U.S.? 300 and something million? Yeah, yeah 300. So it's a third of the size of the United States in total. Yeah. So there are many people that don't know who we are, mm -hmm. you know. So it was great to expose us. So anyways, we did the record, and then it was time for number two. So we did number two. Uh, Pat Travis. Uh, Pat Travis. I keep going, Pat. <laughs> what is it? It would have been great to have Pat Travis on the album. Yeah. Yeah. I love Pat Travis. <laughs> yeah. So we brought in John Deddy, who had played with, with Slayer. Mm-hmm who did a great job, killed it. And we did the second record. We spent probably a year arranging, writing new material, recording it. I mean, we did it with Joe Barisi, who tracked the drums, who does like Tool and Slipknot and all right. these great artists. So we spent a lot of money doing this. Mm -hmm. And then we went and did the tour and we played, um, I think we were doing Zepp Halls. There were, I don't know if they're like 2000 seaters or whatever, mm -hmm. pretty full. And it was great and it was taking off. And then this is where I knew I just don't believe this is going to go much further. In Japan, the label saying, look, now it's time to go to America. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if they're going to understand this. Right. And they're like, trust us. It's going to be successful. Even Rudy was like, yeah, I think it's going to be big. And I'm like, I don't think so, but okay. Right. So we came to LA and I'll never forget it. We played the Los Angeles Convention Center. It was a big anime. I, I saw that show. Were at, you, at were the you anime, there? The, the expo. The you anime were the, expo. Dude, then great. You're the part, you're going to yeah. acknowledge this. My daughter, Brittany, was there as well. So we play the convention center. I think the capacity of that room, it could probably hold about four or 5,000 people. I remember they said, okay, this is going to be big in America. And it was an anime convention, right, right. for anime. And I think there were yeah. like 75,000 people over the weekend at that. I remember we did the sound check, got everything ready. Mm -hmm. We're backstage. And I'm thinking... No way. It's just not going to fly. And we were playing 5 o'clock on a Friday. Walk up the ramp on stage, mm -hmm. and I started laughing. If there were 200 people, I would, <laughs> I would be like, shot. Minus you and my daughter. Right. <laughs> I'd be like, and I remember cracking yeah. up. And Rudy and I just, we had the time of our life. We had so much fun playing it. Yeah. But I was just, I was almost in tears laughing. Going, I told you guys, there's just no way America is going to brace this, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I was... I was right. So that was it. And so then it came time for record three. Sony had paid us. They paid us handsomely. They okay. paid us very well, you know. And so I knew I was grateful for the opportunity. But I was like, guys, I'm out. I, I, I want to go back to Impelitaire. I love this. But your vision or whatever is this is not not going to be something that's going to be embraced globally. Right. You know, it's really kind of Japan centric. And it really was a fun experience. But that was the end of it, right. you know. And at that point, they were negotiating with like Warner's to take it on, and I'm just okay. like, "Come on, guys!" Right? You know. Yeah. But it but it was a blast, and I will always be grateful for one, the learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. To realize to take me out of my comfort zone because when we were playing live, and people didn't realize, especially in Japan in the beginning, I had massive charts on the stage. Mm -hmm. Literally, I had to, I had to chart out all the play because nothing repeated. Yeah. We were talking about like, hey, you know, you get your really cool riff, then you're in the verse, and then you're in the bridge or pre-chorus, and it repeats. Yeah. Never repeated. It was like, we're going on this journey, and oh, oh my man. God, where are we going? And I'm yeah. like, and, and this also tells you how amazing Rudy Sarzo is. He does not get credit for how great of a musician he is. He can, one, I can show him something really complex, right? 
And within about three seconds, he starts to pick it up and mm-hmm. he's playing. You're like, whoa, that was fast. But he didn't have charts. Everything was an ear. And he, he, I don't even know if he ever made a mistake. I was just like, that's incredible. <laughs> and here I have like charts all over the floor, you know? Yeah. Well, I remember some of those songs. I mean, it, it wasn't just that you were playing the theme, but some of those songs were medleys, right? Where it yes. was like they, they glued like two or three different ones together. Yes, yes, yeah, big yeah. time. And that, and that was a problem because a lot of it was new to me. Yeah. I, I did not grow up with this music. Yeah. So they're playing a lot of this stuff, and I'm like, well, what is this? You know, it's yeah. it's not like we're taking a Van Halen and an Ozzy song yeah, yeah, and yeah. blending them together. That would have been easy. Right. <laughs> you know, I can do that all day long. Yeah. This was famous stuff that was written in the 1950s that was, not only was it well before my time, but it was stuff I didn't grow up on. Yeah. So, you know, and they were infusing these. Plus, then they'd ask us to write original riffs to start mm. the music. And then, right. you know, they'd allow me to create my own solo section. So the solo section, the riffs we created, that was easy. Right. It was just like, uh-oh, where are we going now, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're counting at the same time, you know. And and the audience knows those songs. Every so it's, word there's of, a lot yeah. of pressure there, right? Yes. So it's yes. like you gotta get it right. Yeah, Pegasus was probably my favorite. Senseya. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great one. I don't remember yeah. how the song goes, but right. that was probably the favorite song to play. I remember we played that and just, you know, thousands of kids screaming that song. It was almost like, This is the Spice Girls. <laughs> oh, dude, and that was the other thing, not to go on a tangent, but when we did that first show at that Sentai Arena or whatever it was, Japan's equivalent to the Spice Girls. Yeah. I mean, you're talking a band that probably plays the Tokyo Dome, which is right. 60, 70,000 people headline it. Yeah. That band, the girls came up on stage and played with us. At one of the songs, <laughs> they join us, and it was just crazy. It's, there's footage of YouTube. Yeah. I'm sorry, footage on YouTube of it. And these girls come up and they start dancing and they're singing it crazy. And we're just like, I was just like, where. You know, I thought I was on mushrooms or something. <laughs> I was like, this is so weird, but but really cool, you know? Yeah. Anyways, I'm sorry. So that was the tangent no. of Ann Metal. You know? <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I mean, it's something that, you know, it will always be part of your career now. But I'm, I mean, I'm glad the music exists. It was, it was a really cool project. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And like I say, it was a learning curve, you know, mm-hmm. of like, how do they write, uh, you know, their arrangements, um, their time signatures, all of that stuff was very interesting. You yeah. know, plus, they'd also play a lot of times where it's like in a sharp key, which mm. all of a sudden you're out of your comfort level. Right. I want to be in G, but no, or in A flat. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> yeah. where are we going here? Now I got to remember, you know, it's like these typical scales, right? You're so used to doing an A minor, right? That's easy. But now we got to do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm used to, where's the dots? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, but it, it was a lot of fun. 